So you've probably heard the term neural networks, but you might not be confident on exactly what they are or what's so interesting about them. So in this video, I want to cover what exactly are neural networks, how do they work, um, what's kind of the intuition behind why they're so useful, and also particularly focus on how and why they're being applied to healthcare. And in particular, I'm going to go through a few works calculations because I think that's quite a useful way to build up this intuition of exactly what is happening within these neural networks. So neural networks were initially developed in the 1980s and they were inspired by the design of the human brain, this idea that we have neurons and connections between those neurons and the strengths of these connections kind of get updated over time. Those are all the same sort of principles that underlie this idea of neural networks, although things have changed to some extent and some of the architectures that we use for neural networks now are less similar to the architectures of the neural networks that we see within the human brain. But when they were initially developed in the 1980s, they weren't actually found to be that useful. And it's only recently, as we've got a lot more data and much more computing power, that we've been able to really harness the strength of neural networks to perform some pretty interesting tasks. Some examples in medicine include diagnosing based on retinal scans, analyzing colonoscopy findings, screening for breast cancers, and analyzing skin lesions just to name a few. But how do these neural networks work and what makes them so special? In the last couple of videos, we talked about how one of the strengths of machine learning and one of its defining features is that the machine learns without us giving kind of direct input, without us giving some specific instructions for the algorithm to follow, it will figure out its own rules in order to perform a task. And we also talked about how machine learning models are very good at taking inputs and giving outputs and how they're able to identify very complex patterns and relationships within very large volumes of data to give us these outputs. The neural networks exemplify both of these points. But I think to gain some of the intuition behind what exactly doing, I think it would be useful for us to dive into some simple neural networks and just look at the kinds of computations that are taking place. So if we start with this simple neural network, uh, let's just look at how this information is propagated through the network. So basically, there's two main stages to go from one layer onto the next layer. Uh, the first thing is that we just multiply the weights and what these weights are is basically the strength of these connections. So this is supposed to parallel the human brain and then you have these input values which are multiplied by these weights. So the way that we would identify the value for this node is we would look at the input node here, we would multiply this, so 1 times 0 0.8 gives us 0 0.8, and then this input node is 1 times 0 0.2 gives us 0 0.2. So we'd add those up, that would give us 1. So that's the first step. And we could do the same for the other neurons. So this neuron would be 1 times 0 0.4 plus 1 times 0 0.9, so 1.3, etc. The second step is then to actually uh, transform the outputs, and we use something, the technical term is an activation function. But basically what we do is, uh, let's say we calculated that this value is 1, we will look on the axis here of 1, and that will get transformed to around 0.6. So if we run that through, okay, so 1 goes to 0.73, and then if we look at this one, we've got 1.3, so it's a little bit further up, and that's probably going to be maybe a little bit closer to 0.8, probably around 0.8 I would say. Fine, so then 1.3 goes to 0.79, and essentially um, the first step is kind of relatively simple and it's what we call a linear relationship because you're just doing a simple multiplication. But by having this second stage of doing this transformation, it enables the network to identify much more complex patterns and to fit onto them. We're no longer finding a linear relationship. We're taking that linear value and then we're kind of transforming it. As you get to more and more layers of this network, each time you're going to take the previous input, which is all these multiplications done in a linear fashion and you're going to transform that. So um, it's quite hard to visualize, but if you imagine every time you're doing this multiplication, you're getting this linear relationship and then you're kind of skewing it and you're taking that skewed output and then multiplying all those together getting this output and then again you're kind of skewing it so you're going to get some kind of really complex patterns and things being formed within that and to give a bit more intuition behind that if we try and look at it in terms of an equation trying to identify this first node if we come back to the example of y equals mx plus c which we talked about in a previous video basically this input the initial part is just the same so it's the weight is basically the m um, so on a graph, the gradient, but here it's this weight, W, and we're multiplying it by our input, which is X, and then we're just adding a value B, which is just kind of an arbitrary value that gets added on as well. Uh, so it's a similar sort of process to this y equals mx plus c, but then what this symbol denotes is that we're then applying this transformation. So it starts off relatively simple. This is not a super complex relationship, but that's for this node here. If we then go into the next layer, essentially we're applying that transformation again so it's already looking quite a bit more complicated and as we keep on progressing it's just going to get more and more complicated and each of these uh the technically they're called sigmas each of these basically shifts the data and applies this kind of nonlinear transformation and i appreciate for somebody who's not done a lot of maths that this is probably a bit um you know abstract and, and uh, perhaps a bit confusing but the key thing to appreciate is that by encoding this complexity uh, within the neural network it enables us to find very complicated patterns in the data so that's how the neural networks work. 
but before they actually perform the task, we need to train them. And the way that we train it is we update the weights. So we want to update these values of 0.8, 0.4, 0.3, etc. We want to change those so that we get the best mapping of inputs to outputs. So for example, if we have blood tests and we want to predict whether or not someone has liver disease, we want to find the best way to map those exact values to whether or not someone has the disease. And the exact process by which we update these weights is a technique called gradient descent. And this is something that I covered in an earlier video, so I definitely recommend checking that out. But essentially this technique involves using the neural network to make a prediction, um, and every time it makes a mistake, you update those weights so that the prediction is slightly better the next time, and you keep on making more and more predictions until finally you're getting a pretty consistent uh, prediction based on the input uh, and what you want as the output. So to continue building up our intuition of how this works, I think it would be useful for us to go through a few more um, kind of examples of neural networks being applied in medicine. So let's take this example of trying to predict whether somebody has coronary artery disease or predict their risk of having it. So again, we've got a very kind of simple, slightly contrived neural network here, which basically takes in three variables. It looks at their age, it looks at the level of their cholesterol, and it also looks at their systolic blood pressure, or SBP. And let's say this network has been trained already, so these are the best weights for mapping these variables into the output, which is whether they are high risk or low risk for developing coronary artery disease. So the way that this would work if we then had a new patient is, let's say this gentleman is 80 years old, has a cholesterol of 8, and has a high systolic blood pressure of 160. We would then feed that into this algorithm, we'd do 80 minus 70, we'd multiply it by 0.1 to get the value here, etc. Um, 8 minus 6 is 2 times 0.2 goes into here, and then 160 minus 150, etc. And we just kind of propagate that, uh, those values through. And again, we would have our friend the activation function by which we would transform those results. So just calculating the kind of top node here in the hidden layer, uh, so it'd be 10 times 0.1 would be 1. 8 minus 6 is 2 times 0.2 is 0.4, so we've got 1.4. And then 160 minus 150 is 10, so times 1. So we've got 2.4, if I remember correctly. Uh, no, we've got 3. Ah, sorry, I misread that. So this is actually 0 0.5, it's the weight, 0 0.2. So then it's got 3, and then we apply that through the transformation. So 3 here goes to around 0 0.95. We do the same for the bottom node, and then we multiply this by this final weight, and it gives us a final value. And we don't apply the um, activation function in this final layer. So that gives us 0 0.98. And in our case, we will say that the threshold is 0.5. So if the output is above 0.5, we're predicting that they're high risk for coronary artery disease. If it's below 0.5, we're predicting that they're low risk. So our prognosis is that they are high risk. Um, and if we look at another example, this gentleman is younger, uh, he has a lower cholesterol and he has a lower systolic blood pressure. So, um, you know, we can kind of predict where we're going with this. Uh, essentially, we're gonna get much lower values. We end up with zero, that's below the threshold of 0.5. So we're gonna say that we think they're low risk. But the kind of cases where this becomes useful is if you have, let's say someone who's a bit more borderline and your model is well calibrated, uh, which ours almost definitely isn't, um, then it would give you a kind of more useful prediction of, of what their risk would be. Uh, so here we're going to be multiplying through 0 0.5 minus 2.2 and 0 0.3. So therefore we're saying that this gentleman is lower risk, even though uh, he's a little bit more on the threshold because he is a little bit older. His cholesterol is a little bit low, but his blood pressure is a little bit high um, and it's saying that it's low risk. And so this is not too dissimilar to some of the existing uh, sort of scoring systems that we'll use within medicine. Um, often you'll take in these different variables, they'll have different weights and that will give us an output score that we'll use. And there's a lot of these that we do use in the hospital. But what's different with neural networks is just that they can find much more complicated relationships from many more variables. So this is a contrived example to give the principles and kind of demonstrate it, but actually in real life, we would be putting in models with maybe like 10, 50, 100 different variables and would have more layers within our neural network. And that would enable us to basically get a slightly more nuanced a scoring system which may well perform better than existing methods. And there are a number of scoring systems that I'm aware of where the initial method was using kind of uh, more simple approaches and now we're using things like neural networks. So for example, the Euroscore is a score that's used for predicting the mortality based on cardiac surgery and the initial Euroscore model uh, used, I believe it's logistic regression. And then more recently, the latest version of the Euroscore now uses a neural network. So basically it can just improve the performance of these algorithms because it enables us to um, identify slightly more complex patterns and take in more variables. So as another example, um, here we're going to look at liver function tests and specifically we're going to look at ALP, ALT and gamma GT. And again, this neural network has already been trained. And what I want to demonstrate here is um, some of the principles behind how the neural network learns kind of shared relationships within the data and kind of 
patterns of different variables that change together. And that's one of the things that's really interesting about the neural network. For example, I imagine some of you will be aware that ALP can be released both by the bone and by the liver. So if only ALP went up, we might be thinking that actually it's a problem with the bone. Whereas if let's say ALP and gamma GT both went up together, then we'd be suspecting that actually it's more likely to be released from the liver and it's more likely to be a liver pathology. So what these nodes are doing is different nodes within this network are specialized for looking at different things. So this first one takes a lot of weight from ALP and a lot of weight from gamma GT. So perhaps this neuron, uh, this node is good at distinguishing between whether or not you have bone disease or whether you have liver disease. And then the second one, it looks like it takes a lot of weighting from ALP and ALT. So as many of you will be aware, ALT is an intrahepatic um, enzyme, whereas ALP is post-hepatic. So perhaps this node is looking more at what's the difference? Um, is this uh, a disease that's in the liver or is it a disease that's after the liver? And then this final one seems to be taking kind of an even spread of all of them. So this might just be a general metric of, is there kind of a, a certain level of liver damage? And then all of those can then be combined into the final output, which will be perhaps a binary is there liver disease or not? Um, but essentially, the point I'm trying to demonstrate is that each of these neurons, each of these nodes within the middle layers are getting specialized functions. And as you add more and more layers, you'd be able to get more and more kind of specialized patterns. So you can see that if one thing is going up and another thing is staying static and another thing is going up uh, maybe more or less than these other ones, then that can give you kind of a bit more of an indication of, of what sort of thing is going on. And I know also within liver function tests, sometimes we might see that um, gamma GT goes up three times the, the normal range and ALT goes up like two times the normal range and that has a specific meaning. Um, so these kinds of patterns are the sorts of things that neural networks are pretty good at picking up. Now obviously these are kind of simplified and slightly artificial examples, but there are cases of people actually trying to do this um, in real world as studies. And actually with the liver example, there is someone who specifically uh, tried to develop this and they took in these uh, parameters on the left here to try and basically diagnose of whether liver disease is present or absent. So that's actually quite similar to what we were looking at. And there is just a whole host of other studies as well using neural networks, which I'll just display on the screen here as well. So in this video, we've talked about how neural networks were initially inspired by the human brain and how they're able to identify complex patterns within very large volumes of data, um, particularly because of this non-linear element within the way that their calculations are performed. We've seen that as you progress along the network, things tend to become a bit more specialized and they identify these patterns. But interestingly, these types of neural networks that we've talked about are not the types of neural networks that are getting the most excitement within healthcare. There is actually another area within neural networks, which is called deep learning, which are specialized neural networks and deep, as the name suggests. Um, they enable us to perform pretty interesting tasks like analyzing images and analyzing text, and then getting a lot of excitement about uh, how they're being applied to healthcare. So that's what we're going to cover in the next video, and I'll see you there.